Testing one, two. Uh, volume. can't hear it really. That's good. Really? No, good. I can't. It's barely It's good, good ambience. Yeah, I don't mind ambience. We're at the Roxy Hotel in the Soho. In the basement? Is this? No, we're in Tribeca, right? Tribeca, Tribeca. Yeah. Tribeca. What was formerly the Tribeca Grand, now the Roxy. Yeah. How long? When, how, when was it the Tribeca Grand? Was uh, it, that was just a hotel as well? Yeah, this was the same. It was the same thing. It was... Okay. Uh, it was as zhuzhed up as this place? Yeah. Okay. It's just very similar. They did a few things to it. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, they made it a little nicer, I think. The the cinema here is kind of amazing yeah. now. Um, what do you, what do you, what's your association with the cinema? What are you doing? I, I, are you doing? I help curate. I curate oh. this um, uh, monthly, uh, last Tuesday of every month, I, I curate a uh, short film festival. Oh. Right, you and, mentioned that. Mm-hmm. And it's called Roxy Underground Film Festival, or Rough. And um, how do you how do you go about curating? I mean, what's the uh, we, what's we people submit their films okay, online. So okay. And uh, we watch them, and yeah. e- myself and uh, Elise, who runs the place. Oh, okay. And uh, we decide uh, on a program for that month, and sometimes. We have more films than we can program, mm, I bet. so we move it to the next month. And so far, we've had four of them, and they've been increasingly more successful. So. You know, you know what you should do. You What's know, that? I mean, I was this past uh, spring uh, a a member of the New York Film Festival screening committee, mm-hmm. and uh, you know they used to um, just by a little historical information they used to take uh, unsolicited. Uh, submissions mm-hmm. like any festival, you pay your fee and you can submit your f- your feature. But mm-hmm. they never ever <laughs> accepted any of the features because you know they've got the top programmers right. in the country going mm-hmm. to all the top festivals around the right. world, selecting the best films of the year, right. quote unquote. I mean, you know, it's mostly con, yeah, right, and and mm-hmm. Locarno and mm-hmm. Vienna, that type of Berlin mm-hmm. and uh, Sundance, and and then they they um, so they stopped accepting submissions for features last year because they realized it's they don't they're, it's sort of a scam i mean if you're not careful right. you, you know the perception issue and they honestly i think just didn't yeah they didn't want to deal with that so they they but they are accepting uh shorts oh, so yeah. i joined or it was you know it was like an open mm-hmm. thing where and i was selected as one of the people to be on their committee and uh, i watched a hundred short films mm and, um, you know, it's just a great way to uh, see, well, that's a lot, cool. see a lot of shorts. So I'm, I guess yeah. I'm saying, I don't know if you had the time to do such a It really wasn't that. I was given a lot of time. I mean, right. it wasn't the kind of thing where it was like a month. We, we get like, you know, just 30 or so submissions yeah. a month right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's increasing. Well, it's going to go up now that you're yeah. talking about it on the yeah. show. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to go through the roof. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and we, we basically usually show about 10 Okay. Because we have little Q and A's between films with if the filmmakers are in right, town. Right. Right. And and uh, where do where is the submission process done? Where, where, it's is done it on the Roxy Hotel website. Okay. You'll see the Roxy Cinema, and there is a submission there. And is there a fee to submit? No, there's no fee. Okay. Uh, there's no admission. Uh, there are two prizes. Top prize each month gets a weekend at the hotel. Wow. And uh, second prize gets dinner for two at the hotel. That's fantastic. Yeah. Does the first prize, the weekend at the hotel, also include the dinner? No. Because, okay, I'm not submitting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, fuck it. <laughs> That's a ripoff. Everybody has a price. <laughs> yeah. um, well, I'm, we're here now in the Roxy, and it's a beautiful. This is the third thing I've recorded here. Mm-hmm. I did two on one day during the last Tribeca Film Festival, even though I didn't go mm-hmm. to the Tribeca Film Festival mm-hmm. or get a badge this year for the first time in many years. I just blew it off. But I still mm-hmm. ended up mm-hmm. doing a couple of things, which is the really ideal because then I'm not obliged to do anything for the festival. As mm-hmm. far as, I don't mind it usually, I'm not, but, but the, I, it's nicer not having to feel obliged. Right. And if I want to plug some of the films, it's it's more of my own you know decision. Mm-hmm. So... Anyhow. All right. So we're here, and it's great to have you back. I think about you often. I think about uh, our last conversation, which I re-listened to today. 
I, I wanted to make sure I didn't. I can't remember it. <laughs> you don't have to. I don't have to. No, I didn't either. I mean, I wasn't. I remembered some, like a couple of your anecdotes. I remembered you talking about, and people, you know, maybe listen, go back and listen, but the great anecdote about your spending your last four dollars on going to the uh, theater eighty. Uh, or what was it called? St. Mark's, Mark's, you know, Mark's Theater. Right, theater. And, and then um, <laughs> the couple arguing and abandoning all their snacks, and you're able to uh, enjoy them. Enjoy. <laughs> and the great. movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And the movies and blowing off um, Blurry right. for that. Uh, anyway, and there was a couple of other great stories. And then we talked a great deal about your at the time, uh, I guess I won't call it an obsession, but you, had a, a, you were very into serialized TV, you know watching a lot right, of binge right. watching and we talked about that for a while too. right yeah right. I haven't been doing as much uh, occasionally mm-hmm. yeah I could see it comes um, in waves right yeah. yeah you get you do a bunch of that and then yeah then you have to get back to work right but uh, yeah what was the last one I binged I think it was season two of Occupied I don't even know that one Occupied it's just is so that, uh, much, that much that you can't. Uh, occupied is a uh, is a mm-hmm. Norwegian series. Oh, you like the European series? Yeah, yeah I, especially. I, I, Makes I like sense. a lot of them. Um, mm-hmm. This one is about the Rus- Russian occupation of uh, Norway. Mm-hmm. Oh wow! Um, it's a comedy. Yeah, it's a musical actually. <laughs> musical uh, comedy. Um, no, it's a drama mm-hmm. about kind of what's going on. It's a it's a metaphor for what's happening in Europe and in the world. And, you know, Russian aggression, I would say, uh, especially under Putin. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and I'm a big Putinophile, I would say. So. Um, a Putinophile, uh, is that a thing? It, I just coined it. Yeah. Possibly. Right. But no, I, there, sure are, there are books. Did. There are books about him. And so you like you, in other words, when you call yourself a Putin file, you're a Putin file. You're talking about j- learning about him. Yeah, I've I've maintained um, what I would call it used to be, was a file. Now it's practically an archive uh, since about 1998. Really? So 20 years. 20 years yeah. Wow. Well, what's something that we would maybe people, the average person like myself, uh, would not maybe be surprised to learn about him? Well, things come out more and more, obviously. Um, there's a new book by Craig Unger that just came out mm-hmm. called uh, House of Putin, House of Trump, oh, right. yeah. which is about the sort of, you know, relationship, business relationship that Putin and Trump have and how that's morphed into a more political relationship. Right. Yeah. Um well, one of the things people, you know, don't know about Putin, you know, he studied e- economy, economics. I he was a, yeah. Yeah, so he was not a military guy per se. He was a spook. He was a KGB guy, but he got into the KGB through uh the School of Economics. So he was um drafted into was he or He was he? uh it was a great assignment because in and there was the man who was his mentor who sort of got him into the KGB yeah. was a man who eventually in the 90s became mayor of uh in the early 90s became mayor of St. Petersburg which is where he was from basically Oh well, it's interesting too cuz I mean if, for those who don't know St. Petersburg I mean yes it's it's an old one of the great old Russian Magnificence, majestic cities. However, it's also Russia light on some level. Yeah. It's also it's the Baltic. It's Europe. Yeah. It's kind of the most European. It's the most European of all the you know Russian cities. Right. Um, probably because yeah. it's a port city. It's kind of like it's the way city. it's, it's port city. So it's kind of like the way uh, people from Shanghai feel about Beijing. Mm-hmm. It's the way people from Saint Petersburg feel about Moscow. They're two very different cultures. Yeah. Yeah. So Shanghai is a very uh, economics-based city, uh, obviously a port and has relations with other countries, whereas Beijing is inland and is a political city. Mm-hmm. So Moscow is like that to St. Petersburg. Mm-hmm. So it kind of explains maybe 
him. It explains partly his why his yeah why he's the richest man in the world. He's worth roughly two hundred fifty billion dollars. Is that is he richer than Be- Bezos? Jeff yes, Bezos? He's, yeah, Bezos? he's much richer than Bezos. He's much richer. Yeah. Okay. But the it, thing about Putin, unlike Bezos, Bezos, we know how yeah. he made his money. <laughs> Right, and we know pretty much how he spends his money, whereas with Putin, none of that. It's all dark. It's all dark. This book by Craig Unger just just came out, right? Yeah, it's very, two weeks I think ago. I saw him on um, either but, MSNBC or well, it's what, likely he was on that one of those. Yeah, he was probably, probably he's on a, probably a book tour of some sort. Yeah, um, and also one other thing that people don't know about about mm-hmm. Putin, yeah. is that. Uh, you know, and one of the things that Craig's book points out is that since the mid '80s, even before the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, a lot of Russian mafia were getting their money out of the country because they knew it was collapsing, um, and other people got their money out of the country by laundering it in Trump condominiums in New York. I had heard that. Okay, so that's no. So what it's, people right. don't know. Okay. Is that Dude, like, um, <laughs> you did that list? Of t- I'm sorry, <laughs> it's Putin, a tick. Putin yeah. uh, was also a major money launderer because uh, he for, learned it at the university. Yes, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. wow, because he had a co- he, combination of economics background and yeah. understood banking, right? And how banking worked in Europe at the time, and to some wow. extent still. And he was also in the KGB, so he also had the spy mentality. Right. And so everything that appears is not what it is. It's what's under the table. Yeah. So when he was assigned in 1982 to the East German desk, mm-hmm. East Ger- to East Germany, and his little fiefdom mm-hmm. with the KGB was to... Um, uh, make reports on the economics of the the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. That was his sole job. Yeah, make economics reports on the war in Afghanistan. And what he started to suss out and wondered why, uh, because he's also a chess master. So he wondered why, mm-hmm. even though the war was nonsensical on mm-hmm. any real level. He understood the political ramifications of the war. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He understood why politically it was necessary in a way. But he didn't understand economically that it felt like the cost of the war far exceeded mm-hmm. the political import of the war. Mm-hmm. And when there's an imbalance like that, it's a bad war. You You basically lose even if you win, which you can't win in Afghanistan. And so from the politicians, the Soviet politicians who were for the war, it was kind of obvious why. Basically, there were no jobs in, in the Soviet Union, so they needed to have a place to put all the men, which was in the army mm-hmm. in Afghanistan. They also needed to make money making arms and military equipment for their version of the military industrial complex that's understandable but from a military point of view it was just like you guys are getting creamed why would any military guys be continuously for the war and at each month it became more and more apparent that militarily it was a bad idea mm-hmm. So most of the military were either on the fence or not really like gung-ho, yeah, let's keep this war going, except for two Russian generals. And he kind of wondered why these generals were so for much for the war. And he started to look into it, and he noticed a couple of things. He was very sharp. As a young man, he was extremely... He's still sharp. But, yeah, obviously. Um yeah. Mm-hmm. But then he was super ambitious and sharp. Mm-hmm. And what he noticed was that the planes carrying supplies, these military cargo planes carrying supplies, mm-hmm. always used the same amount of fuel, hence cost, 
when they went brought stuff into Afghanistan, but when they came back empty, there should have been a lot. They, there should have been more fuel. Much they used much less fuel. Much less, less fuel, rather. Yeah, because the, the, they're much yeah, lighter. Right, of course, sure. Except occasionally, there would be these planes that be using up much more fuel. So he wondered why these planes, what they were carrying, and it turned out that they were carrying heroin. So these two generals were running heroin out of Afghanistan. Now, it was known in, in Europe... 80s? When yeah, is this? yeah, in the 80s, mm-hmm. that all the heroin in Europe, especially in the 80s, mm-hmm. was coming out of Afghanistan. And the only people who could get it out were the Russians. Mm-hmm. So that was known, but they weren't, didn't know how. So... And the the people who were, uh, uh, you know, at the top of the chain of heroin distribution were the Albanian ma- mafia. So it in was coming, Soviet Union. No, in Albania. Oh, in a, it was okay. coming out of Afghanistan into 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 Moscow, basically, or into Russia, Russian military bases, essentially. Then from there. It was sent over to Albania, I got you. Okay. usually by trucks uh-huh. that had like, you know, the the right paperwork, uh-huh. and they went across the border to Albania because it was communist, and mm-hmm. then the Albanian mafia took it and distributed it to the rest of Europe. Uh-huh. Now, Putin followed this and figured it out that this was what was going on, and the more he followed it, he also noticed that these two generals had a couple of you know what were ostensibly safe houses which were you know dachas or apartments mm-hmm. and he was able to convince one of his cohorts to go into one of these apartments now one of the one of the cohorts who went into the apartment is the guy who kind of spilled the beans so to speak eventually he had a falling out with putin and spilled the beans oh really is he yeah. alive no he's dead yeah um, he fell off a building. It happens. It happens. <laughs> you know, you know people on. slip. So it every day. And what he basically said was they went into the apartment and they expected to find mm-hmm. who knows what. And what they found was that of the six rooms in this apartment, they were stacked from floor to ceiling with cash. Jesus, what 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 current what currency? Uh, in mean? those days, it was before the euro, yeah. so it was okay. like it you was know lira and Swiss francs, French okay. francs, and right. pounds and no. dollars, right. etc. Not rubles. Um, and there's some rubles, <laughs> what? Uh, some Albanian money, um, but every denomination you can imagine. And what Putin realized at that point was that these fellows could had the whole system rigged up, yeah. but they didn't know how to launder the cash. That's where... That's where he came in. Trump. No, that's where Putin came oh, Putin in. Putin came in because he realized there's an opportunity here. Yes, so... To get he, rid of the cash out of the apartment. Right. So he went to them, to these generals, introduced himself, and they were like, who the fuck are you? Right. Get out of our face. And he said, no, I can help you. And he said, what the fuck? Who are you? He's a low-level... KGB guy right. he's making like two grand a month at this point right and this is like 1983 and he says I know what your problem is your problem is getting rid of the cash and they're like <laughs> <laughs> who's this he goes I'm KGB yeah. I know this shit yeah so I'm also an economist I can help you launder I can help you get the money out of your apartments Get him into Swiss Bank, get you an account that you can transfer that money to anywhere in the world without anybody ever noticing one single thing. And they were kind of wary of him, but they decided to... Well, he's KGB. Yeah. Well, yeah. He, not only is he KGB, but who the hell is this guy? Right, right, right. right. No, how did that he knows how to do this. Yeah. But they were desperate enough to take a shot. Mm-hmm. So they gave him a small amount of money, a, a, to Putin a great amount of money which was about a million and a half dollars and he said alright see what you can do with this and we'll, if you fuck it up we're coming after you mm-hmm. we kill people for a living and we will kill you and Putin said I won't fuck it up but here's my cut 10% of every dollar I launder I keep 
And they were kind of like not sure, but they agreed to it because 90% of something is better than zero. Because the, Yeah, they the, couldn't move it at all. They couldn't Just move it at all. Just sitting there collecting dust. How did the original friend, who's no longer with us, though, how, how did he gain access? When they, you said Putin convinced uh, his colleague to uh, check out the, get in the apartment. Right. So he broke in? That's yeah, okay. they broke okay. in. All right. All right. They, they um, uh, w- w- that guy um, uh, was not an economist. Um, he was KGB dealing oh, with see. internal security. Okay. He so knew someone who could, yeah. knew someone who was a burglar. Right. And was, they, of course, they have a, a lot of access to all this stuff, uh, yeah. information and whatever. Uh, and so you're learning this, these stories through your reading? Or is it yes, through? Yes, through a variety of readings. As I said, going back to 1998, when mm-hmm. Putin first sort of surfaced uh, more on the international scene, uh, he became re- a fascinating creature for me because the first thing uh, I, I saw his face and I went, wait, this guy's a serious dude. Yeah, I could tell too. And the first article I read, which I have, was um, a kind of a small article in a British newspaper called The Independent. And it was about his... Um, fascination with uh, martial arts and chess. And I said, a a guy who was formerly KGB, because he got out of the KGB in 89. Mm -hmm. So, a guy who was formerly KGB who was fascinated with chess and has climbed up this political ladder very astutely Mm -hmm. as somebody to like really watch. And I was more fascinated by the martial arts and the chess than anything else. Uh, and I just took a folder and I wrote Putin and I stuck this article in it mm-hmm. and uh, I opened a file eventually on my computer and now yeah. there's sub files right. and um, uh, put on Google alerts, you know, eventually, you yeah, know, anything sure. that comes up. Mm-hmm. But even before well, Google be and before computer, you know, I was computer savvy perhaps. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, uh, there were, you know, prior to Putin gaining power in 2000 on the New Year's Eve of 2000, uh, which was really amazing, um, that whole coup d'etat almost, um, there was some information leaking out because he didn't have control of everything, but he certainly had control of a lot from... The whole 90s. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the 80s he spent in the KGB, pretty much. Mm-hmm. And he's the guy that makes 2000 a month. By 1988, 89, when he leaves the KGB, he's worth $15 million. Mm-hmm. How did that happen? Right. Well, we, now we do know. But, and uh, he buys himself into St. Petersburg pol- political system, cleans up the Russian mafia in St. Petersburg by killing off four of the seven Russian gangs uh-huh. or the so families now, so now he has the mafia he has the KGB and he has the government mm-hmm. really all he needs to do now is control mm-hmm. the presidency and mo- mostly the oligarchs right which right. is what he's done yeah uh, and, and Trump is just another oligarch that right. is in his pocket right this is a the mini series. This is the series, rather, right? That yeah, you, you're right. Are you writing something? I've written something about it Maybe that was more fictional. Right. Uh, I'm toying with some other ideas right now, but because the story is so, such a natural, yeah. I just wonder what that would. Yeah, it would I, I mean, what it would, you know, the uh, implications of of, of of putting of putting other series like that would be. You know. Well, it's like but going it's, to. An HBO or Netflix yeah. and saying, hey, I want to put together a, essentially a non-fiction series. Um, mm-hmm. The Putin, Putin early days. Yeah, I mean. Um, mm-hmm. And here's a, here's, a, here's a kicker. So when he, when they give him this go-ahead, these generals, he takes two giant suitcases of cash, gets on a plane from Moscow 
goes to Zurich, checks into a hotel, finds the smallest bank you can find in Zurich, goes to the youngest guy who's got a desk in that bank, Mm -hmm. says to the guy, I'd like to start an account. There's only going to be three people who have access to this account. It has to be numerical. It has to be transferable anywhere in the world. And if you do this with me, within three years, you're going to be the president of this bank. The guy's like, who yeah. are you? What are you talking about? <laughs> and, then, yeah. and he says, trust me, I'll, I'll make you the president of this bank. And he says, how much do you want to open an account for? Now, an older guy would have said, like, where is the money coming from, maybe? Sure. Or a million and a half is not that much. But a young but, guy, you know, a million and a half is a lot. Yeah, right. I mean, you, you don't want to be a little coy. Before you agree to <laughs> you know, the bribe. Yeah, the kid is yeah. the president of that bank, became the president of that bank. He's no longer a kid and he's no longer president. He's retired, but he's... He's alive. He's a, No, he's, he's very, very much alive. Yeah, yeah. He's very quiet and very alive and yeah. very circumspect. Never has said one word about it. And he lives in his uh, chalet in the Alps. And yep. Yeah. Sips his wine <laughs> from his own yeah. uh, vineyards right. and lives a good life. And that's what Putin has done all the way along. Now, Putin's 10%, here's the big thing about it, is in Russia it's called the Putin cut. The Putin cut is 10%. Since, you know, he used to get that in St. Petersburg, then he got it in Moscow when he was running the economy from Moscow uh, under Boris Yeltsin. Mm -hmm. But once Yeltsin abdicated to made basically Putin the head Mm -hmm. in turn of the century in in like New Year's Eve Mm -hmm. 2000 Putin has gotten a Putin cut from every single dollar that's going in or out of Russia sort of like the sales tax it's a tax exactly it's a tax it's exactly it Mm -hmm. it's the Putin tax Mm -hmm. now that's a lot of money yeah, even for an economy that isn't necessarily one of the biggest. But I mean, if you're it's, that's it's, if that's but if you're getting ten percent of everything, yeah, it's the fourth uh, biggest economy in the world. Oh, it is now. It is yeah. the fourth. Is it yeah. really? Yeah, it's the United States, China, and that's not Germany. Stay the order very long. What? And that won't be the order in a matter of no, year. a couple no, more no, years. Per, so they say China's going to well, surpass the U.S. Yeah, it depends. Mm. There, are, China has its own issues, but. More than likely, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, they've certainly uh, understood economics and have run a very tight ship mm-hmm. where the United States has not. But the United States is more innovative overall. Mm-hmm. But that could, because of our education system and stuff. But uh, there are, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of Chinese economists running all around China, putting it all together. Mm-hmm. Um, its top students are sent to Western co- were, were sent to Western colleges. Now there are essentially Western colleges in China. Right. Um, Campuses, I mean, um, uh, mm-hmm. of like Harvard or wherever. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, adj- adjunct campuses, uh, sites. Um, but London School of Economics, uh, University of Pennsylvania's okay. school, uh, MIT school, and Stanford school, were rife, riddled with uh, Chinese students. Right. So it's so ironic because it's been in the news lately that there's uh, been uh, lawsuits, you know, from Asian Americans who mm-hmm. are being discriminated against because the the university camp, you know, the universities like Harvard, MIT, are mm-hmm. now not accepting some Asians that are are performing and who are, you know, the top mm-hmm. submissions, but that they're not being t- Discriminating against. Discriminating against because they, mm. they can't just have a school with 90% Asians, you know. So they create these campuses. A lot of these families move to the states in the mm. first place to give their children right. the opportunities that the top universities can help afford them, right? And then the, the campuses end up moving to those countries, which is something those uh, Asian families can never have predicted. Right. There's an irony to it. Yeah. I mean, well, it's just crazy. Primarily because... the. Chinese government initially, early on, mm-hmm. um, if a student was incredibly bright and and ambitious, mm-hmm. um, and could go to a English school or a French school, Sorbonne or Harvard, uh, they would pay the fees 
so they never had to get actually uh, scholarships. Mm-hmm. So the you know, a lot of the universities went, oh, we don't have to pay a scholarship for this person. Now let's bring him in because at the first they wanted to bring up you know diversity. They wanted to bring up the Asian population in the school mm-hmm. and show, oh, look, we have right. yeah. a good amount of Asians, but it actually. You know, some schools, it mm-hmm. went too high, and now there's that reverse discrimination. Yeah. But by now, the Chinese government has actually built schools for Harvard or yeah, <coughs> Sorbonne right. or yeah. in, you know, whether it's Beijing, which is the political capital, or sh- Shanghai. Which I wonder is if it's good for academia. Because, I mean, it, 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 it's good for academics. I mean, because, you know, there's so few jobs available. For people that are graduating with their degree, with the, you know, with the intention of being an academic, there's so few jobs in the states that now maybe there's an opportunity in these other countries. Well, in China, I don't know if it's happening in other countries, but if it succeeds there, maybe that's the way to. I don't. Well, know. the bigger picture is other historically that it's a it's more of a question, I think, of globalism versus nationalism. Mm-hmm. So the sort of Trumpian. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. make America great, all that stuff, make China great, make Russia great, all that kind of nonsense mm-hmm. that's being touted by Xi or Putin or Trump or, you know, uh, the Hungarian you know guy or uh-huh. a Polish guy. You know, it's happening all over the world. Um, that's a, uh, a kind of an echo from the last century. And in the last century, especially the major Second World War, Prove that nationalism is actually not viable. Mm-hmm. The problem has been is how to get to gl- true globalism, and history is moving in that direction, whether you want to or not. Globalism, right? Uh, I mean, it's just been the tide of history has gone from these tribes to these villages to these towns to these nation states to these nations Mm -hmm. nationalism you know along with energy basically coal to oil Mm -hmm. now it's the end of oil uh, fossil fuel era so it's going to the next state and then coal (laughs) (laughs) just kidding clean coal clean coal (laughs) yeah Uh, Uh, what was the third nation uh that you mentioned uh u.s china and the fourth being russia you said was that the uk no no, What's Germany. Germany. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. So Germany essentially runs the Always European... Always keep them in the top is my, my perspective. Economy yeah. is predicated on German economics. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Russia is trying to get into the Middle East, which they've gotten into now. They've made deals with the Saudis and this, you know, what's ever left of Syria and Iraq, which is nothing. And they want, you know, Europe. Mm-hmm. That's the battle. China has gotten Africa and Southeast Asia and, you know, Korea, essentially, and maybe Japan they'll get. Mm-hmm. So they want the Pacific Rim. The problem for the United States has been that, you know, our natural way to go is really to unite with Canada and Mexico rather than the president who is messing right. around with our two yeah. border it's, partners. Right. Um so, you, you know, kind of what the European Union did with the euro, I always thought that the Amer- mm-hmm. Americans, really to strengthen America, hmm. let's say, or... Part of NAFTA make a, a is, cur- is common to, currency? Yeah, called the Amerigo. Well, you may which want to go be, to peso instead, but well, Mexico... not the dollar, not the yeah. Canadian dollar, not the peso, not, you know, other yeah. currencies... But the America, which is like the euro, and would be from Canada all the way down to Chile. Oh, including uh, Central America? Central and, America uh, and South America. And South America, too. Yeah, the, all the Americas, South, Central, North, uh-huh. into one currency, no tariffs, mm-hmm. no borders economically. You could build a road from the tip of Argentina and Chile yeah. all the way to the top can of walk. Canada. Yeah. And... Everything would flow back and forth in one. Mm -hmm. Now, that would strengthen our economy tremendously 
it would like make it like maybe six times bigger. It sounds so corporate. <laughs> what? It sounds so corporate. What's the world is going? You know, it's like it's like the corporations that are that have merged. You know, and yeah, you know, well, it's a similar idea. Yeah, that's economics. Be, I yeah. mean, so prior to going from nations mm-hmm. to globalism, there's an intermediate step which Europe has tried, and that's called continentalism. Mm-hmm. So continents forge mm-hmm. before glo- the whole globe forges. These continents forge, and then the four continents, essentially the five continents, actually mm-hmm. combine. Yeah. Interesting. <clears throat> Not to go to some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, much more sort of... Uh, mundane, mundane. Well, it's not mundane, uh, just or just shallow. Uh, it's, oh, shallow! I, I, I love just shallow. Caught, I've caught. I just caught. <laughs> I big, finally caught up with the Americans, which oh. you were, I was thinking of as you right. described. Yeah, that was uh, good because it takes place in the eighties. You know, yeah. it's it's uh, it's kind of about a, a little bit about Afghanistan and mm-hmm. the war with Russia. You know, Russia. Uh, so the breakdown so of the Soviet mm-hmm. Union. They, I know. I mean, I'm in the fifth of six seasons. Oh, I've been kind of going. They're six very seasons short. Great. Oh, good. Because uh, I'm wondering how they're going to resolve it. Cause, uh, mm-hmm. My ex-wife was actually the mother of my son is, was in the sh- uh, one of the arcs. Oh yeah, one of the shows arcs in the second and third season. Oh yeah, which was she? There was a character that was working for one of the companies that they were trying to breach, and she gets she she meets a dastardly end. She gets killed. She, her husband was abusive, and they were alcoholics. Both uh, she was an alcoholic, mm-hmm. African American character. Uh-huh. She was an alcoholic. She meets uh, what's the wife's name? I can't remember. Oh, uh, Carrie Russell. Carrie Russell's character. Right. She goes to the meeting and creates a friendship right. with with. Oh them. yeah, yeah, I remember. And then right, right. she gains access to the security. What is it? It's like some sort of. Oh yeah. I'm trying to remember that. Uh, it's a no. It's government bio biotechnology tech? firm. Yeah. yeah, like kind of firm. Uh-huh. And they become friends, and then right. she ends up you know killing her <laughs> right. with a right. vase or something. Right. Because she refuses. She's going to go tell the cops that she got. You know, information, all that right. stuff. So, Carrie Russell kills her. Yeah, Carrie Russell killed a lot of people. Yeah, a lot. Oh, she, yeah, they, she's about to kill more. Okay, I'm sure. Um, it's a, yeah, no, it's a very good series. I finally decided to dip in. And, it, it, and it's also, since the seri- the seasons are relatively brief. Yeah. You know, there's only like a dozen shows per season. I really yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I think... So I think yeah, I, I've yeah, been enjoying somewhere between it. eight and twelve. Yeah. I think it's I think it's no no I think it's a, each season is like twelve or twelve really yeah yeah really and um, oh, so I'm sure. I'm on the sixth mm-hmm. and uh, and you know it does move brief quickly briskly mm-hmm. through the seasons um, and uh, you know it's an interesting show um, yeah, it is how they're portraying you know it's interesting to watch right now also. Have you seen the Swedish Danish series The Bridge? No, I I, you, you mentioned it last mentioned it. time yeah. when we met, which was a year and a half, about a year and a half ago. Yeah, that's super great. Yeah, I'm um, gonna. How do I see that one? What's where? Uh, I think it's, it's on Hulu or or Amazon. It's on one of them. Okay, I'll have to see. Uh, I, I have remember. Amazon. <laughs> I don't have Hulu. Uh, I can't remember which one it was on. It might be Amazon, but just check out The Bridge. But they've made it's a, a couple a, of a remakes. Scandinavian? Yeah, it's the Danish-Swedish version, because I think they've made oh. one in America okay. and one in England, I believe. Um, and I think that one was called The Tunnel. Oh. But uh, it's the, <laughs> the same bridge and idea. Tunnel. Well, I, I, like, I, I like you. I, I like, although I, I've, I've seen some of the British stuff, too, obviously, like uh, Helen, uh, Helen uh, uh, what was this? Mirren? Helen Mirren series, which is many years old, uh, uh-huh. but they... It was about, you know, where she's the uh, head of the oh, right. police um, department. Right. Uh, but I like a lot of the Scandinavian productions. Uh, yeah, this, and, this and one Scarsgard. is particularly beautifully yeah. shot. They, they do that. They shoot beautifully. But the main thing is the female cop character, the Swedish cop, mm-hmm. is like one of the best written and, and performed really? uh, roles I've seen in the last 20 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. You, you, were, you were talking about it last time. Yeah, I might have to borrow your login for her. No, yeah. I can't see this on there. Because <laughs> I don't, it's one of the only, um, you know, streaming services I don't either have. You, you'll you'll find it. I, I, yeah. I'm not sure what it is exactly anymore. But, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, there's a few uh, foreign ones that, um, and yeah, and the, and the Scandinavian ones tend to be shot and edited and the music yeah. and all that very well in the 
they tend to yeah uh like even like the girl with the dragon tattoo the original one yes yeah. not the david fincher one but right. it was very very well done yeah. i thought yeah i i did too uh yeah i mean, I, I think this was this st- this st- stellan sarsgaard mm-hmm. starred in a um Yes, in a series. Uh, it's on. I believe it's on Netflix. Yeah, that was good. Which I enjoyed. I thought it, it limited, kind of had a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it was like yeah, six, six episodes. Six episodes yeah. where his partner. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a cop, and his right. partner is dead. Is, is ki- yeah, but you don't know it at, until yeah. a little bit in, right? Yeah. Uh, but and he sees dead people essentially. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. it's kind of a, a corny thing, but they they pull it off real well, and it's yeah. due to the just how well the production and the level of acting and mm-hmm. so, you know his dance at the end uh, is a little bit um, corny yeah, ending. It, it was, I thought the ending was a little corny for it I had thought, its moments I thought it lost some of its its, it uh, had its moments yeah it did have its moments but I, I just find myself really enjoying those productions anyway wow that's so so impressive that you're you have this whole uh, focus uh, I hesitate to call it again an obsession but it's uh, I think mm-hmm. you really need to do something with that and you, you know, you, it's an international cast, which would help marketing it to an international audience. Right. I think you can get international distribution. As a res- I mean, you know, it's just a natural way to approach such a, yeah, a I've, story. I've, I mean, I've written a series based have? on that. Yeah, okay. it's called The Best People. It's um, um, I've written the first six episodes. Oh wow! That then that uh, sat that satire, Stalin about uh, what is it called that came out with Steve oh, yeah. Buscemi and. Yeah, uh, which yeah. did really well. That that film, it's yeah. like out of nowhere. That film, um, yeah, it that, was. What was it called the Killing of Stalin or the Death of Stalin? Death maybe. of Stalin. The Death of Stalin. Was that what yeah. Was, this it was is really a funny. little different. This yeah. is no, more I know it is, but I'm just saying that that was a good indication that there's maybe, and of course, with the just it, so much stuff is about to come out about the, all this. What you we're talking about is mm. going to be all confirmed. Yeah, not mm-hmm. that we don't already know it. It's just so s- silly. Yeah. Anyway, anyway. Yeah. That's where we are. <laughs> I'm so glad we ended up talking about this. It was great, great to hear about this. And it's... Uh, what have sure. you seen lately? Yeah. It, well, one thing, I just today got the uh, the schedule for the P- the press and industry screenings for the New York Film Festival. So oh, yeah? That's one thing that I just got today, so I'm kind of excited about. I'm working evenings right now. And so this allows me, if I can get myself up and out... I right. can see quite a few of them. What virtually. films are going to be screening there? Well, they've got, of course, the new Coen Brothers, for instance, uh, uh-huh. the, the the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which I hear kind of already not their greatest project. Right. It was intended as a, also as a limited series or something right? with different characters in each story, and they've kind of ended up right not do, doing it as a feature and i hear it's kind of a, a, mm. a flawed but right. but anyway and the new Quaron alfonso Quaron is supposed uh-huh. to be roma and then uh-huh. the, uh, i want to see that and uh lathamos's new film Lathamo, Uri, Uri, Uri. Oh, the, oh the guy did the lobster mm-hmm. his new film uh-huh and, and uh I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I haven't seen the lobster yet i I, mm-hmm. I saw dog tooth and i liked it immensely yeah well he's gone really far cry from there mm-hmm yeah, no, I'm looking forward to it. And, you know, Kamita, what's his, the Japanese filmmaker. They're, 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 mm-hmm. You know, they have their favorites. And they, yeah, they, they do. They really just, I mean, every time. And, and there's a new, um, what's the German filmmaker? I, I've seen all of his films. He's really, oh, Christian Petzold. He's a, mm-hmm. one of these guys. They just constantly, every film, right? Uh, and you know, that they, they bring him back. And then there's like some, they now include some of the young American filmmakers. I don't mm-hmm. know. We'll see. Alex Ross Perry. Mm-hmm. His, he has a new film. I mean, do you keep up on on, on young um, filmmakers that are kind of coming out now? I, yeah, do I, you, I I I'm not like obsessed with it, yeah. or I'm not like um, yeah. um, you know, for several years I was not. You know, last several years uh-huh. I I was not going. Well, I'm not going to as many films because uh-huh. I think primarily the the hour and a half, two hour. Form. Uh, you know, form. Yeah, yeah. Just didn't make sense to me. Didn't feel right. Mm-hmm. It felt everything was squeezed or they're forcing a narrative down my throat. Um, I don't know. I was just not there. But the longer form yeah. seemed uh, like novelistic and had, you know, um, more nuances and uh, digressions and, and mm-hmm. was able to explore things that felt right. 
So, but uh, who knows? I mean, uh, you know, and I've also liked the short form. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know. Well, um, they're not. They're so doing something entirely range. different anyway, though. You know, they're not going for that, the arc. They're not going for right. quite, you know, uh, capturing a moment is different than telling a yeah. st- story and having a three. But like uh, films like, uh, what was the one that won the Academy Award? The Something of Water. Right, Shape. Shape of Water. Yeah. Uh, Were you dissatisfied with that? Uh, completely. Mm. I thought it was absurd. Yeah. Well, it, it definitely was absurd, right? <laughs> I'm not, it was absurd on any level of mm-hmm. cinema. Yeah. Well, uh, the fact that it won an Academy Award was like. Well, what is you know? Yeah, but what, whatever the Academy Awards have really been. A, no, they, kind uh, of, generally speaking, the films that it win yeah. are not. Not generally, but but I will say this though: if you look at the Academy Award nominees for best picture in the last year i mean most of them were these art house films i mean mm-hmm. or have genesis from art house you know like yeah. including that one you know well, i like filmmaker. moonlight yeah i thought that was a very good film right and they were character I based. Stru- yeah. structurally and yeah uh the story and the acting it, it, the scale right. seemed right the scale of shape of water seemed completely wrong right um uh, then there was uh i mean I don't know. It's been it's been a few years since yeah. films just really. Now that doesn't. There are films that when I go see them, they mm-hmm. go, "Wow, that was really good." Yeah, I I, I saw um, a couple of times. I've gone. I try to get I'm trying to get out to see some screening. Like I uh, the um, it's not easy all the time because it really requires a lot of my time. It's like a four mm-hmm. hour yeah. commitment, you know. Which is you know it doesn't sound like a lot to people, but I took my son to see eight. You know, I saw it on the. Mm-hmm. The, the uh, here down at the Roxy Theater mm-hmm. at the Roxy Hotel, eighth grade. I saw it at the BAM Cinema Fest. Uh-huh. Um, you know, Bo Burnham is the director. I He's heard a that comedian. Was a good film. It's really beautiful, and uh, I loved it so much. And I, my son just graduated the eighth grade last, you know, mm-hmm. spring. And so, I asked him, "Do you want to see?" Th-? I showed him the trailer. I said, "I just interviewed, you know, these guys, and I the, the movie's very beautiful. Would you?" And he says, "Yeah, let's. I'll see it." So I, I have an inside guy at the uh the alamo draft house in brooklyn so mm-hmm. i contacted him and he got us tickets not that i wouldn't have <laughs> spent the money on it right. but it's nice uh, and then we can buy lunch there and, right. and so we had a great time and he loved he really liked the movie and it was okay. a really personal story from this young eighth grader girl who's very mm-hmm. un, um n- in, not confident uh young girl who's struggling has mm-hmm. a single dad mm-hmm. played by uh josh hamilton a great actor Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, so I, I saw that. I really love love that movie. I got to see Ethan Hawke's film. It's called Blaze. I'm about, about to go see it. Oh, in 20 minutes. Oh, you're going to see Blaze. Mm-hmm. I, let's talk after because I'm curious yeah. to know. What, I, I I really liked it. I mean, oh, it's good. very very. It's flawed in some ways, but the flaws are are there's certain films that are kind mm-hmm. of sprawly, messy a little bit because right. they're just. But they're going for things that are very. Positive, and he, it there definitely was, takes you to a place. There's another in the time. film people talked a lot about a yeah. couple of years ago, with um, uh, what's that actor? Uh, his brother is a famous actor. Casey yeah, Affleck. Casey Affleck. Casey. What was that film with Kay, in Boston? Uh, wait, the well, they, there was a few, I think, um, uh, where he played this guy who is he's kind of down and out. Oh yeah, yeah. Manchester by the Sea. Manchester, Manchester by, by the Sea. Manchester by the Sea. Um, right. I, I really thought, oh, when I saw it, I said, Casey Affleck will win the Oscar. As soon as I... It's one of those performances really? that you just... I just knew when he walked out, all based on that one scene with, uh, you know, what's-her-face. You know, oh, the, that one... She has that one scene. Yeah, where, you know, she confronts him in a poly- Yeah. And like... Um, I just said... Yeah, Michelle Williams. Michelle Williams. See, there, that's there you your... Go. Yeah, Michelle we Williams. We have, one, like, we have <laughs> together. just half a brain There's so much we can do together, <laughs> right. right? We just put them together. Put them together. We have two half brains. I'll, I'll say Williams, <laughs> you say Michelle. Um, yeah, well, that was an okay Don't, I scene. I liked it. I liked the movie. What was it about that put you off? Did I you just, just think it was unbelievable? His characterization mm-hmm. and... I thought the writing was pretentious as oh, okay. hell. Okay. And I thought his mopey kind of like I'm an actor, watch my ticks. Oh, I see. Kind of thing was Interesting. just like. I'd have to watch it again. I was moved at the time. Um, but I'm a sucker. I have a very, um, I, I'll admit it right out that I have a um, real just sentimental side to me. I cry a lot at movies. I, I was like, like, I remember when I saw that film, like it that. was like. Um, 
at like a screening of some sort, mm-hmm. and I'd read about it, a couple articles yeah. about it, and I, I remember un, unable to to contain my um, my dislike uh-huh. so much that when I when the lights came on and I got up from my seat, I went. That is the most overrated movie of the year. Interesting you say that because <laughs> I remember in an earlier case, it was one of those, again, Boston films, not a kind of Lonegren directed film, but mm-hmm. it was one of those films that, oh, uh, what's the guy? The is an author and he writes all the, he's written all those Boston mm-hmm. movies like uh, the Clint Eastwood one that he directed with the, with the, with the, uh, you know, just all these um, mm-hmm. Boston based. I, I usually pull the names, but I'm hmm. not in that space right now. But anyway, and the I the Boston just wrote, Strangler. No, but he, he no no. It's just a bunch of different mm. t- these stories coming out of Boston mm. from a Boston author based author, mm-hmm. and the Afflecks are usually in them because they're from Boston. Mm-hmm. You know. Anyway, the I just remember afterwards getting up, and I think David Denby was sitting behind mm. me, and I was just like. I couldn't believe how overwrought, how mm-hmm. just annoying the movie was. And I'm standing in the elevator lobby, and he was just, or just talking how great it was. And I'm like, there, all the critics are going to just give it these great reviews, and it's really yeah. just not good. I just, yeah. I just thought, I didn't have that reaction to Manchester by the Sea, but again, I just, those kinds of stories of, you yeah, know, it was like of, so inauthentic. It was yeah. so pretentious. I felt it really kind of soured me to. Mm-hmm. To a uh, certain kind of, um, mm-hmm. you know, what people think is good is really yeah. questionable I, in my mind. And I've been wrong, so, I, you know. Yeah. And, but well, I will also mention I, I did go see also a new uh, documentary. It's called Three Identical Strangers. I mean, uh-huh. I try to see. Uh, right, right. I've heard about one that. called, um, and uh, some of these people have been, come on the podcast, like the filmmaker who made this documentary called "It's Not a Good Day for Me." Uh, it's you know, it's interesting that uh, as I said last night, I didn't get to sleep, and mm-hmm. no doubt it's affecting right. my brain. Right. Yeah. Well, it uh, will do that. Yeah. Um, the but, brain needs and to sleep. I did see another one I really enjoyed was Love Gilda. I just saw that about Gilda Radner. Uh huh. Really. I'm hoping to bring on that filmmaker. That would be fun to talk about Gilda Radner and that period of right. 70s comedy and the, that just yep. incredible how they were all rock stars back then. Yeah. And uh, and I'm supposed to go see... What am I going to next? Uh, I guess it doesn't really matter. I would just watch John Landis's film, Blues Brothers. Because uh, of Aretha Franklin. Yeah. 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 And uh, it had so much energy to it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, they were all high on cocaine, sure. but um, uh, it looked like they were having a lot of fun. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to go see uh, Spike's new movie. I did I see that, too. Yeah. I did. Uh, I, wanted, I, I wanted to talk to you about that, too, mm-hmm. what you think of that. Yeah, um, I mean uh, the reviews I've read all like, you know they are like sort of he's been on vacation and he suddenly returned. Spike they, they makes really a thought, lot of stuff. Yeah, no, he does. He's very prolific. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, of course, he's done the TV version of right. uh, to, uh, "She's Got to Have It." And right. The you know he'll do he he'll him like a, another uh, New York based prolific filmmaker will will usually make three or four terrible movies and then a, a really good one. Right. You know, I'm referring to. Who? Although I don't think he's really made anything good in 30 years. Woody Allen. I'm just... Who? Woody Allen. Oh, no, Woody I, Allen. I know. I think he, unfortunately... Or yeah. no, I don't think, unfortunately, I actually wish he would retire. I, I would have preferred to be on his own... Terms. No, terms, exactly. But uh, he's been... Re- seems like he's been put out to pasture. Yeah. Um, just because well, of might, the hashtag. Well, he might... He might... Uh, uh, who knows what, yeah. what he's capable of? But he's what eighty four, eighty five. He's got to be up there. Yeah. Have um, you ever met that? Have you ever met him? I met him once, f- very briefly, uh, through Carlo De Palma, who was a c- yeah. cinematographer of his. Uh-huh. And Carlo was married to a producer at, that, at the time I was working with. Um, so I met, uh, but it was just like, <clears throat> I know four or five people having lunch. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I always—I li- mean, I li- I've always liked actually Spikes and Woody's um, 
uh, uh, style of working just one after the next. Yeah. But um, <clears throat> sometimes it's good to take a little time off just to... Reboot, in a way, creatively. Well, just to, or yeah, because... Find new inspirations. It, otherwise, you're really kind of making the same movie over and right, over again. Right, right. How, how do you find new inspirations if you're just... You know, already on to the next film. Well, the problem there is is how much control you have. So you can find some different inspiration if you're only a director and have other people write your scripts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then you bring a different version of that director. Well, that's true. Like Scorsese yeah. will, you know, or, 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 or Spielberg. Yeah. Um, oh, you know, and the, speaking of Scorsese... He's he he's directed this this author. I'm thinking about uh, the, this Boston author with the Departed. The guy who wrote the Departed is the Boston guy. I'm thinking. Oh, of. you know he's very famous oh. uh, now, novelist. And right. He, he but he wrote the among mm. his many mm. novels. Of, um, I don't mean to digress. Right. Anyway. The Departed. Right. Um, that was with Nicholson. Yeah. So I'm looking the, forward to the new Scorsese with. Oh yeah, with Pacino and De Niro. Right. Yeah, that's uh, and uh, Pesci and Keitel. Oh yeah, which is biz I don't think that those two who used to kind of alternate right, right in the right. Or have different chapters in the uh, those films. They they were all in it. I mean, wow, I don't know all how, four. I think so. Well, I don't think they all have the biggest parts. I mean, I think right. I think uh, play Pesci, De Niro, and Pacino are the big. I don't think Keitel's in it. That's big, like I hear he's. In, I uh, think he's in it. I may be wrong. That that would be cool. Yeah. Um. I kind of like sure. Harvey a lot. Me too. Um, well, he did all, he did, collaborated with uh, Abel. Uh, Abel, uh, yeah. Quite a bit, right? And Defoe, yeah. he, oh, he's playing Van Gogh, I guess, in a new movie. Yeah. And that in Schnabel's movie. Schnabel. Oh, that's right, of course, the uh -huh. Schnabel. Uh, I'm just, I, you know, I, I don't, normally not a fashionista about things, but they they took this photo of Schnabel from, I, I'm guessing it was Cannes because he, mm -hmm. he was like on. You know, it looked like he was right there on the, what's the called the the part of the corset, the corset or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he he was wearing like this button down typical shirt, but the sleeves sleeveless, Wakata. sleeveless. Uh huh. I don't know. He looked just like bizarre. You know. Yeah. Just, well, like, that's not a Julian very, is bizarre. Yeah. Uh, definitely bizarre. Um, but he makes good movies. Yes. And you know, among other things, yes, he, I've liked. He's a good painter. He's, he's makes good. you know overall mm -hmm. really good movies. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, especially the butterfly movie. Yeah, that was beautiful. Uh, I thought his Basquiat movie was a very good first. Yeah. Uh, directorial film. He got a great performance out of Jeffrey Wright. Great casting. It, yeah. Unfortunately, I, the only thing I didn't like about it was the title. I think it should have been called Schnabel. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, it was very little about Basquiat in mm. there. Mm -hmm. Um. Did you see um, Sarah's uh, new documentary? Yes. The, 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 yeah. Okay. She's yeah, supposed to do the podcast. She's coming on. Uh, she, oh, yeah? I, well, I was trying to get her, and then... Well, Sarah makes really interesting films. She has family films. things going on with her parents, and... Uh, oh, right. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah. But she makes very interesting films. Yeah. I mean, her early films are especially are really beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, really, really beautiful. Um, and quite poetic. Um, this film... Um, <clears throat> I think it's an interesting film. I'm glad that she made it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very happy about that. I'm not sure what the heck is the point of it, but um, but at the same time, I'm, I'm happy she made it. Yeah. Well, it's a, called Boom for Real. It was out yeah. already. No, I've seen Magnolia it. Magnolia distributed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but, I'm, I'm but, 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 um, she got distribution. Yeah. I'm actually kind of glad. Yeah. It's a good, it's important, you know. I'm glad mm. to that. In a way, I'm glad that uh, it's kind of like over because she's. And then she was helping uh, her her friend, her partner, with uh, his new project. Apparently. Oh yeah. And then yeah, so that's why. So mm. she said contact her after Labor Day. So I guess that mm. that means now I can right call her or email her. And, yeah, they're uh, probably arrange. in post production now. But she'll make some time. And then yeah. you know what's nice is I can maybe it'll inch me closer to the, <clears> to him too because I've been <clears> wanting to get him on. Yeah, and you should get Jim on. I don't know if he does a lot of these things, but uh, he does a he, he does a fair amount. Mm -hmm. He does. Uh, I just did uh, the last Anthony Bourdain show with him. You did? Mm -hmm. uh, just a couple of weeks before Bourdain passed away. Oh, I didn't know. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, no, he's 
Is that going to be um, aired? I hear there was some new material. That's yeah, I think it'll be aired, um, I think, end of this month or maybe the beginning oh, of October. Soon. Really? Yeah. Well, it was soon. like done in, I don't know, when was it? Like April or something? Mm-hmm. Wow. That had to be yeah. right right before. Yeah. Where, where, what was the... What was, your your roles in the <laughs> we, we, we he just asked us a bunch of questions about drugs oh really uh, basically but he's a, he's he was a a real cinephile uh-huh. yeah no, Tony. No, no. he was a real you know, i've seen him at film festivals i mean i saw at the hampton film festival last year mm-hmm. i might have actually he was uh, a super cinephile yeah. he, he he watched way more movies than jim or i um uh and he would get very obsessive about particular genre or particular countries films like he was at the time he was very much enamored in the last winter around last winter um of um indonesian kung fu movies of which i had no no idea about and he said oh you never heard of this guy oh yeah you should see he's made four movies he you know you should watch the second and the fourth one those are the really good ones i'm like yeah right but don't listen don't 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 watch the this other guys yeah because he's 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 just like you know he's a joke he's not so he was very um interesting didn't he he was uh in a relationship with asia argento yeah asia yeah yeah he was very much in a relationship asia Asia Argento. Argento. He was in a relationship with Asia Argento. Yeah. Now, didn't he? Uh, and then I hear he paid off this kid. Apparently, who's now suing. Yeah. Or tried apparently. to sue, or has come out as a, which makes me feel like um, it's a bad idea. It's a Harvey Weinstein, <laughs> uh, folks. Yeah, but it's. I feel like it. It's. It was. I don't know. It's my. I have a little theory that, you know, I feel like uh, maybe Weinstein's people have kind of made this happen to kind of. Uh, compromise oh, Asia? Asia's, Asia's uh, you know her reputation and her uh, I don't know he's I, go I to jail think that Asia has her own whatever yeah, sure. going on um, you know um, I think you know she has her own trajectory prior to mm-hmm. sure. meeting Tony Bourdain mm-hmm. Um. Uh, you know, I'm I'm of a mind that uh, when somebody tells you how happy and head over heels they are in love with someone, beware. Mm-hmm. Like there's something wrong. <laughs> uh, I think it like being in love in that way. Yeah. Uh, romanticizing love is the worst thing you can do. Mm-hmm. Um. And I think that Tony had, uh, it was, you know, romanticized food. He romanticized cooking. He romanticized films. He romanticized this relationship. Uh, He romanticized drugs. Um, uh, And I think that's problematic on a certain level. Well, it was for him, you know. It was for him. And... But he was such such a delight, you know, such a like delightful guy that you kind of like, what the fuck, mm-hmm. you know? But nobody there, was there. Nobody who could tell him that what you just said, maybe ineffectively. I suppose so. Do you think? Well, I didn't know him that well, so I mean, right. I told him my version of it. You did. Yeah, I just said I I think romantic love of that sort is okay when you're 16 or 19 or maybe 23. Mm-hmm. But after that, yeah, it's a drug, and you know your experience with drugs. Yeah, and this is just another drug. You're on drugs, dude. And that was what I said to him. Wow. <laughs> um, well, you were certainly. He gave you the opportunity, the the, the platform. No, to do he that asked me about because, it because yeah, right, and because of the nature of that. Yeah. Uh, show that episode or whatever. You're well, outside of that episode, in that episode, there was mm-hmm. w- some discussion of of our histories on the Lower East Side. Mm-hmm. But okay. Post that show, uh, we had another couple of conversations, and uh, you know, he was, you know, and I mentioned to him that I thought that his questions to Jim and I on the show Mm -hmm. about this kind of nostalgia for the Lower East Side and our drug days was kind of like silly, 
in a sense that you can't romanticize your drug taking. Yeah. It's not, um, and you know, it's not helpful or uh, part of our age at this point. Yeah. Like things that you can do when you're in your twenties are not things you're going to do when you're in your fifties or sixties. It's just, that's just common sense. But he still had, and he and he ascri- and I could tell because I I get it because I have that same aura Sweet. of like romanticism. Like I want to you know make this you know like oh you know this is the best da 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 or mm-hmm. you know the, like I am so in love. I go uh, you're you're in trouble, dude. Yeah. What do you mean by being in love? Isn't that the the whole thing? The I go whole no. Point. It's right. it's a drug. Mm-hmm. It's a drug, and it's a like. You know, and other conversations I had with him, you could see the longing for the drug. In other words, the longing yeah, for right, that. Yeah, so you describe it. Yeah, it's different than if you describe, your, you know, like a service to others as you know what you discover is being the fruit of life or the mm-hmm. meaning. You know, it's like service to others. Serv- mm-hmm. You know, that's healthy. I mean, yeah. you know, um, I mean, so the he couldn't separate. I think the exuberance mm-hmm. that he mm-hmm. had for life. So it's, with, kind of, it's a manic, it's a bit of a manic uh, kind of. Uh, yeah, I guess that's probably the, the the psychological idea of it. But yeah. I think there was something more, and also the fact that he was not grounded. You know, he was traveling so yeah. much. Right. He was never in one place for any length of time. And his, even his apartment in New York, he was only in New York for like four or five nights a month. So when you're not grounded at all, yeah, and you have this thing. So at any given moment, you can get time. hijacked. And I have a feeling that that's probably what happened, although, uh, uh, what the fuck do I know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting because you can kind of... And I think on what the fuck do I know might be a good place to end. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank what you. What the fuck do I know? <laughs> Thank you. This, this is so much fun. Yep. Well, let's not wait till another year and a half, though. And I... Definitely. All right.